Hello and welcome to the Vine Life Podcast. I'm Tony Clark, your host. Today I have the honor of having Krista Bontrager on the program. Now, Krista is a theologian. Uh, she works in the realms of Bible exposition, the supernatural, and cultural apologetics with a focus on race and justice. She's also the co-founder of the Center for Biblical Unity and a popular YouTube teacher and podcaster. Uh, she's worked for over two decades in various capacities in theology and apologetics including a staff theologian at Reasons to Believe. So, Krista, thank you so much for coming on the program. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. Uh, so, Krista, I, I always ask my guests, what got them to the place that they are today? Now, you're, you're known as a, uh, a writer, a theologian, uh, among various other things. But what got you to this road? Let's start with apologetics. What got you first interested in, in the field of apologetics? Yeah, I was... Um probably 22, 23 years old. And um, I'm in my 50s now. So it was a long time ago. And it was back in the um, early 90s. I was newly married and me and my husband, uh, I vividly remember we were moving into our first little uh, place. It was a, a guest house, a back house in uh, La Mirada, California. And I was unpacking our wedding presents and listening to a Christian radio program as I was doing that. And there was an advertisement on the program to come to a class, like a Sunday school class, where you could um, ask questions about the faith. And I was just immediately struck to the heart of like, wow, there's a place you can go and ask a question. And, and I didn't even realize, I don't think until that moment, that that was a need that, that I had. And so um talked to my husband and I said, hey, would you be open to going to visit this class? And that is where I met uh, a man named Ken Samples, who is a staff theologian at Reasons to Believe. And that started a friendship between Ken and I. We've been friends almost 30 years now. And uh, he really played a role in my young life uh, at that time in introducing me to apologetics. Ken used to be on staff at the Christian Research Institute with Dr. Walter Martin, who, if anyone is around my age or older, may be familiar with from back in the day um, and back in the 80s, early 90s, and the wonderful ministry that they had doing countercult uh, apologetics. So Ken became a friend, and then he became my colleague for 22 and a half years at Reasons to Believe and uh, is a frequent guest on my podcast. And um, that was really what pushed me into it is my husband and I went through a season of learning more about our faith and apologetics was a big part of that. Krista, now you spent many years at, at Reasons to Believe. Uh, tell us about your time at Reasons to Believe. Oh, I, I went there in my 20s and left in my 50s. I, I kind of feel like I grew up there. Um, it was a it was a long season of my life. It was a very uh, productive season of my life. I started when I was four months pregnant with our oldest daughter. I had been teaching full-time adjunct at Biola University in the Biblical Studies and Theology Department. I loved teaching. Um, I just thought that that was going to be my job for the rest of my life. And then um, I, my husband and I got pregnant. We had already been married um, seven years. We'd been married quite a while, but still didn't have children. And so I knew that being a, a young mom and working full time in academia was probably not going to work out. And I, I really didn't know what I was going to do. And my friend Ken Samples, who I m mentioned earlier, called me up one day out of the blue and said, hey, I don't know what you're doing now, but I always thought it would be fun if we could work together. Um, how about coming for a job interview at Reasons to Believe? And I hadn't seen Ken in about a year or so. And I didn't want to just tell him on the phone, like, hey, you know, I'm thinking about moving to Boston and getting my Ph.D. So I thought I'm just going to go down there. Reasons to believe at that time was was located like a mile from my mother's house. I'll go have lunch with my mother. I'll go see Ken. It'll be lovely. And so I went and talked to Ken and he's telling me about this job. And I thought, 
that sounds really interesting, but I can't even think about this. I'm about to go get my PhD. Well, he says to me, um, would you come back for another interview and meet with Hugh Ross and his wife? And for some crazy reason, I found myself saying, sure, no problem. <laughs> like, that was not what I was wanting to say. So between those two interviews of when I saw Ken and when I met with Hugh and Kathy Ross, I found out I was pregnant. And so going to move to Boston and pursue my big dream of becoming a, an academic that just had to, I had to step aside for the Lord's plan. And so I ended up getting that job. I reasons to believe I was four months pregnant. I really didn't know what the future was going to be for me. Um, and I ended up staying there uh, 22 and a half years. I raised my children and uh, the week that my youngest daughter graduated from high school, um, I left reasons to believe and went into full-time ministry at the Center for Biblical Unity um, uh, just about a year ago. And so it was a wonderful ride. I thoroughly enjoyed working there and um, watching the ministry grow over the years. I really had no interest in science apologetics going into it, but I really needed a job. And I thought, well, I love Ken. I love working with Ken. This could be interesting. And it turned out to be a wonderful blessing as I learned and grew in my depth and knowledge of general revelation and issues related to creation, which little did I know I would need that foundation for the work that I do now related to race and justice. And um, I didn't know that God had a plan all along in, in what he was doing. So it was, it was a very wonderful season working at Reasons to Believe. Well, a, a very wonderful season, it seems like. Also a very wonderful organization as well. Now, you've left um, Reasons to Believe to... Uh, now, are you one of the co-founders for the Center of Biblical yes. Unity? Yeah. So we uh, co-founded the ministry in February of 2020, just a little before the pandemic and the social unrest. Um, my ministry partner, Monique Dusan and I uh, co-founded it. We really didn't know what God's plan was. We thought maybe it would be like a speaking ministry for Monique to go speak occasionally to pastors. She was working full-time as a director of a multi-site food pantry. She loved working in social service and had worked in social service for over two decades and really had no plan to leave that. But we had uh, filed the papers uh, to become an official entity. And um, those papers were approved uh, in February of 2020. And little did we know, you know, that what was going to happen. And Monique and I had been for about a year making videos about race and justice issues on my YouTube channel. But we couldn't hardly pay people to watch. <laughs> they had like 30 <laughs> views, 50 views. I mean, it, nobody wanted to talk about race, you know, prior to that. Yeah. And um, then when uh, Ahmaud Arbery, that whole situation happened, and Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, all of a sudden, we started getting thousands of messages from people who were desperate for answers and information. Um, they didn't, they couldn't make sense of what was happening in the world. And um, in June of 2020, um, Monique did an interview on the Elisa Childers podcast that did very well. And that was really the podcast that pushed the ministry into people's conscious awareness. Uh, we went from 35 followers to, I don't know, almost 10,000 in a, like a week. And in a span of about 10 or 11 days, Monique was on the Elisa Childers podcast. Nancy Piercy tweeted about the ministry. And Natasha Crane uh, had a blog post go viral that mentioned us. And so those three events happened in a very short amount of time. And Monique, knew at that time, I'm going to have to leave my job, you know? So we started fundraising for her salary and, um, I continued to work through all of that full time and then did 
Center for Biblical Unity early in the morning, late at night. I was working about 60, 70 hours a week. I don't think Reasons to Believe even knew what I was doing because I was I was a director and I was trying to keep that job and get the ministry going. And after about 14 months of that, I just I, I just had to say, like, I, I have to take a step of faith here to step into this realm full time. So I left my very nice paycheck <laughs> that I had had for a very long time and stepped out on faith. And the Lord has um, really blessed that. And I'm, I'm wake up every day, very humbled and grateful for what I get to do. Yeah. And it, it's my understanding watching some of the, the podcasts and listening to some of the podcasts um, that it's more about critical race theory. You deal with other things as well on the, all, all the things podcast. Is that correct? Yeah. We have four podcasts at the center for biblical unity. One, our flagship podcast, it's called all the things. And that's the one that Monique and I started in 2019. And um, the idea of the podcast was to use current events as a way to help instruct Christians on the, on, on their worldview and theology. So I wanted to use current events and a fun conversational format to give Christians some basic instruction about the faith and kind of backdoor the instruction uh, through by using the current events as, as the, the hook. And um, so we started doing that. Monique had never been on camera before. She didn't have any experience, but I felt like she was a natural and I She's thought, good. yeah. So I thought this, this might be something. And um, I had asked the Lord for about seven years for a podcast partner that I could do that kind of show with. I had the idea in my mind of what to, I did, and I kind of tricked Monique into it. And uh, so we do the All the Things podcast live on Saturday evenings. I have a Theology Mom podcast that's a little bit more focused on theology for for everyday people, theology for regular people. <laughs> and um, and then we uh, Monique has a podcast focusing on needs of the Black community, uh, needs and culture of the Black community called Off Code. And then we have a weekly live stream that we do a little more informal called the family meeting every week over at the Center for Biblical Unity, where we're just trying to train and equip people on current events, how to think about current events through particularly related to race and justice. Um, so we do a lot of content, but we're really just out there trying to create a family, a spiritual family for people. Many Christians feel very alone and confused of the events of the last two years. And so a lot of our content is about equipping, but it's also about building a spiritual family for people and helping to to help them uh, make sense of their world. Yeah, and you you all do a very a great job as well dealing with uh, real world issues. You know, and Krista, in, in this world of pride celebrations, uh, critical theory, propaganda in schools, media. Uh, in a society that seems like it's exchanging light for darkness. Yeah. Um, I, I really wanted to ask you, and I think a lot of uh, ladies are listening or, or they will listen or watch this. And I wanted you to talk about the importance and necessity for women being involved in apologetics. Uh, because when I typically, I, I'll be honest, when I think of apologetics, I, I, I research uh, questions on, on the defense of the faith. I find very few uh, women out there, like on a podcast or out there in the media. And it seems like in the Christian faith, we're fighting with one hand tied behind our back because it's primarily a male field. Uh, can you speak on that or the yeah. importance of uh, women being involved in apologetics as well? I, I love the question. And I, I feel such a sense of optimism today. Um, 30 years ago when I was in seminary, um, you know, it wasn't like the way that it is now. Uh, I, I always, I went to Talbot School of Theology, which is the seminary connected to Biola University. That was a wonderful season in my life. I loved being in seminary in so many ways. It was a growing season. I was a young married woman. Uh, we had no kids. It was just a very fun season for my husband and I. And, um, but other women were rare. Uh, there, there might be a few women in the Christian Ministries program or Christian Ed, um, but in my program in theology, 
I think I was the only woman in my program. I think there were maybe wow. one gal who was in the philosophy and religion program at Talbot at the time. There, there weren't a lot of us. So it was the great benefit of that was that there was never a line for the women's restroom <laughs> in seminary. <laughs> there weren't that many of us. It's wonderful. Um, so, yeah. you know, I never felt like an outsider in my classes. My my seminary professors were all men. They were all hugely encouraging. Um, I only ever had maybe two peers who hassled me about why I was there. Um, it was, you know, awkward <laughs> having one of your male classmates ask you, you know, why are you, what are you doing here? Um, that's okay. Yeah. You know, uh, but, um, you know, it was a, it was a lovely season in my life and I thoroughly enjoyed it. When I, one of the things I did at Reasons to Believe was that I built an online school and I was doing online education before it was really even a thing. Um, and I had the idea, I, I have a media background as my undergrad, and I had this idea that I knew enough about production that I could pre-record lectures and put them up on online. And the Internet was still fairly new at that point, And there would be a way for students around the world to access them. And so I started building these classes. And, um, you know, now online education is everywhere, but but. I, I was doing it all the way back in 2003, and the the beauty of that that I discovered is that it made a seminary education accessible for women who couldn't leave their house they, because they were home raising their kids, and it was an unexpected consequence. And so, in the beginning, you know, we would be blessed to have you know maybe three women in a class. But I thought even that was encouraging as I was more than most of my classes in seminary. By the time I left Reasons to Believe, it was normal for us to have 50 to 60 percent of the students be women. And wow. so online education, I think what became an equalizer for women to get more education because they could they could balance it in their work life um, home life responsibilities and they could listen to lectures, you know, as they were vacuuming or, or helping the kids or whatever. And so we started getting, you know, homeschool moms and, and just all kind of different women from all walks of life all over the world who wanted access to apologetics training. And what a wonderful, unexpected blessing that was that God created. I had nothing to do with that. That was all God's idea in, in helping me make that a reality. And then in 2017, I started seeing on Twitter, a handle from an organization that says Apologics. And I thought, what is this Apologics? And so I started following them and it was a bunch of women who were interested in apologetics and it was called women in apologetics. And I thought, I don't know who these people are, but I really need to meet them. And so I started asking the Lord to make a way for me to meet them. I said, I don't know, Lord, how you're going to work this out. And so a few months later, so I started praying for them in May of 2020 or 2017 I didn't know who they were. I didn't know their names. I started praying for them. And then in November of 2017, I was in a booth in Providence, Rhode Island, um, working for Reasons to Believe. And a woman came into my booth and on her name tag, it said women in apologetics. And I, I, it was a gal named Rachel Shockey. And I said, hey, you're from Women in Apologetics. That's Apologetics. And she says, yeah. And I said, I've been praying for you. I didn't know who you were, but wow. now I do. And so we introduced each, you know, ourselves to each other. And we shared an Uber to a meeting. She invited me to something. And we just exchanged phone numbers and we stayed in touch. She ended up inviting me to be on the board for Women in Apologetics. And I was there at the very first conference that they had. And I sat in the back of that little chapel at Biola University. 
And I looked out and saw 300 women at this conference, all wanting to learn apologetics. I thought, this is, this is so mind blowing for me. And then I recognized that many of the speakers were women who had taken my online classes like five to 10 years ago. And I thought, what a beautiful thing you've done here, Lord, that I had a small hand in some of these women's journey to get educated, to be, go into apologetics, to become teachers. So I'm kind of the old woman in the mix um, with all these young gals. But it is so beautiful to watch all these young gals come up and find their voice. And the Women in Apologetics organization, we just had our fifth conference last week um, in Boca Raton, Florida. And it's just a growing number of women. And so what a beautiful thing it is as to how much growth there's been. And women are discovering apologetics because their kids are asking harder questions. They need the discipleship and training for themselves. Even though they've grown up in the church, they're recognizing they don't know enough because their kids are asking questions that they never asked. And so they're wanting the training. It's awesome. It's a, I feel like women are the rising stars right now in, in apologetics. Absolutely. And, and the more that you look for apologetics on YouTube, for example, not only you come up, but other, some of the other ladies that you talked about come up for apologetics and, and philosophy and, and those deep questions. And I, I love to see that. But Krista, do you have a vision uh, for all that you do, all that you're involved in? Do you have a vision specifically for women? What do you see, what, where do you want to see your ministry go to? Or where do you want to see it? Who do you want to see it reach? Yeah. What, what impact do you want to see it have in the future? I, I really hope that my legacy will be that I, I was able to teach regular people how to reflect deeply about their faith, whether those are men or women, um, that I was able to translate things from the, the academic world into the language of the regular person. I remember when I was in seminary, uh, taking a hermeneutics class and reading the book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. And I remember reading that book and thinking, why did I have to wait until I was 25 years old and go to seminary before understanding how to properly interpret the Bible? Every Christian needs this information. And that's really what I have spent my entire adult life doing, whether that's through my website teaching or through Reasons to Believe, is how do I translate these very complicated ideas into a language that a regular person can understand? And that's my hope because I want to train regular people so that they can, they can disciple the 8 to 15 people in their life, in the faith. So, you know, whether that's their kids or their small group, or their coworker, whoever it is, God has strategically and supernaturally placed people in our lives where we can have influence. My goal is to equip Christians to be able to disciple those eight to 15 people in their lives. That's what I really hope my legacy is um, for the long term, as, as long as God grants me life here that, um, you know, as we travel and speak, how can I help people be passionate about God's word and reflect deeply on the great doctrines of our faith. Well, it looks like you're certainly having success doing that or God's opening those doors. So it's, it's really good to see that. Now, Krista, uh, let's, let's change gears a little bit. I want to talk about some popular or some topical things that we're, we're experiencing today. And you recently had a video and the, the video, I think it was on your Facebook page primarily. And the question was, is America under God's judgment? Yes. And I think that one of the verses that we all get confused on is Second Chronicles, the Old Testament passage, chapter 7, verse 14. And I think that we have a tendency to use that passage specifically for America. And if I'm not mistaken, that's specifically talking to the nation of Israel, but it may have some broader concepts that may affect America as well. Yeah. And, and I, you don't have, certainly I don't want to uh, take you through each and every 
t- a point that you went through yeah. in this video. But just in general, let me ask you that question. Because of the things that we're now experiencing in America, do you think that Mer- America is under God's judgment? Yeah, that's a great question. And I've done part one of that series. I hope to do at least one more um, here in the next couple of weeks uh, in that series. And um, it's, a, it's a question I've had to rethink, to be honest. Um, I used to be very, um, I used to have a well thought out view of, of how to answer the question, is, is America under God's judgment? Or could any nation be under God's judgment today? I kind of think I had this vague answer to the question of like, well, could we ever really know that? And that's how God did things in Bible times. And I think was sort of my vague answer. Like I said, it wasn't well thought out. But um, when we started getting so many questions about God's judgment against our country, in particular um, because of the issue of slavery um, and getting that question a lot at the Center for Biblical Unity, I started rethinking and going back and restudying the scriptures of what, what does God say about this? And um, I think in general, when I look at the sins of the nations and I look at the kinds of sins that the nations would participate in when God's judgment would come, it's generally things like, it it's usually starts with very corrupt governments and corrupt leadership. Um, things we were just reading in our family devotions this morning in Micah chapter six. And that what you see there is that the, the, the Kings, the government officials have become so corrupt uh, in deceiving people fraudulently engaging in government level fraud um, using unequal weights and measures, which is basically the ancient way of saying corrupting the monetary system. Um, having um, at the government level, at, at the level of, of the highest level of leadership in the land, pr- approval of things like witchcraft and sorcery, of um, deep spiritual or uh, sexual sins. These are the kinds of things that God judges nations for. When I look at the trend lines of our leadership in our country, I, I have to notice that, you know, there's, there's some parallels here that are happening. I, I do think that um, our government is deeply corrupt. Now, I love our country and I love the noble ideas on, on which our country is founded. But I think that our current leadership, and I'm not talking about a political party, I'm talking about the government as a whole. I think there's a lot of very deep corruption in our government. And a lot of it is related to bribery. And the scriptures have a lot to say about leaders and judges who take bribes. I think that our government is engaging, has been engaged uh, for a couple of decades in monetary policy that is using unequal weights and measures. And it is, it is disrupting our monetary Um, soundness. Again, I'm not talking about political parties. I'm talking about widespread corruption across our leadership. I think that our government enshrining gay marriage and redefining the created order of Genesis 1 and 2, um, the trans agenda, again, attacking our creation identity of Genesis 1 and 2, um, I think that these are the kinds of sins that we see in scripture that God judges nations for. And, and I would say, yes, I, I do think that if we are not currently under judgment, it's we're well, it's on its way. Uh, I personally, when I look at the consequences of God's judgment, what that looks like, if I look at, for example, at the end of Deuteronomy, or even again, going back to Micah 6 from our reading this morning as a family, the things that God does to a nation when he sends judgment, he corrupts their food supply. Famine can often take over. 
illnesses can often run rampant. Um, these are the, uh, they get conquered by their enemies. You know, uh, the, the military goes in decline. When I look at our country, I have to think like, you know, there's some things happening here that causes me to have questions that some of what we're experiencing could be the judgment of God. And it, it, it could get bad. It could get really bad. But I think the call to that then is for the Christian to make sure that you are being obedient to God in all things. Um, because when God's judgment comes, it, it will fall probably on both the righteous and the unrighteous. We, we will not be unaffected, but we do want to be found to be among the remnant of the faithful. Yeah, and you know, you've you've kind of answered that because my follow up question was, how can we, in the, as the church in America, respond to the things that are going on around us? Yeah, you know, how can we respond? How can we live for t- today and and plan for tomorrow? Yeah, and I think that you kind of answered that is just to uh, keep in His Word. You know, as as He's the vine, we're the branches, and keep abiding. I guess, in that vine. And, and it, I think that you made a good point that, uh, you know, the sun and the rain fall on the, the righteous and the unrighteous at the same time. So if we are under God's judgment or we're, we're well on our way, uh, those things will certainly be affected by those as well. Yeah. Right? I, and I think that what do we do? What do we do? We um, just like um, Ezekiel, it says in the book of Ezekiel, you know, um, plant vineyards, you know, we, we need to go about our life. We need to, we need to get married, disciple our kids, have kids. I mean, even the thought of having kids is under attack. To me, these are all part of the creation mandate. That's, I think our culture is absolutely attacking the creation mandate. So we want to get married, have kids, disciple our kids and kind of ignore the world. I think that what the, one of the best things Christians could do is begin to create um, culture, find two or three other families that are like-minded, disciple your kids together, go on camping trips, create, create fun for your kids to have friends with like-minded parents to, you know, help each other, educate your children, read the Bible together every day, pray together as a family every day, Um, These are the things that God's people did when they were in exile. Um, What we don't want to do is become addicted to being liked by the world. Um, We want to be about our father's business, no matter what craziness is happening in the world. So that's really my best advice is, is work hard, get married, have a family, disciple your kids and, you know, work for the kingdom. Um, th- th- that's what we should be up to. Yeah. Pretty, pretty wise advice. And thank <laughs> you for that. Uh, Krista, you wrote an article uh, recently, or maybe within the past year, year and a half. And the title was, are we all God's children? And mm-hmm. I wanted to discuss that with you because many times even pastors will be up in the pulpit saying, Oh, we're all just God's kids. We're all just God's children, regardless of your relationship with God. And can you dig into that just a little bit? Um, it, it, are we all God's children? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that article is available at reasons.org. It's at the Reasons to Believe website. And um, I think that, that we have to differentiate. It's helpful to differentiate between the creation mandate in Genesis 1 and 2 and the Great Commission in Matthew 28. And to understand that we as Christians, we, we kind of have two identities. As a human person, we are all created in God's image. And that image is fallen. We learn that from Genesis 3. But we learn from Genesis 9 that in spite of the fall, that image is still part of us. And we still have inherent value, dignity, and worth. And so what I would say is a part of our creation identity 
is that that is true for all humans in all times and all places. If you are a human person, you are created in his image. You, as an image bearer, have inherent um, value, dignity, and worth. When we get to Matthew 28, 19, when we get to the new covenant, we see that Christians have this unique distinction of an additional identity, and that is as a child of God. Um, the One of the major ways that the New Testament explains our salvation is with a family motif, that the Father is our Heavenly Father, and we come into that covenant relationship with the Father through the Son, and we are co-heirs with the Son. So I like to say, you know, um, he's kind of like our big brother. He's the one who goes before us, and he's he's the one that we are co-heirs with, and we become the father's children and we become spiritual brothers and sisters. This is not the only motif of how scripture explains our salvation, but it's one of them. And I think it's powerful to reflect on the, the fact that um, we are seen uniquely as the children of God and God is our father. That is a unique relationship we have, and I call that our salvation identity. So we have a creation identity that we're all created in his image, in God's image. And then our salvation identity is as his child. And that is unique to those of us who are in a covenant relationship with God. So to answer your question, are we all children of God? I would say no. We're all creations of God. We're all created in his image. But only Christians have this unique relationship with God as his child. Yeah, and I think maybe you talked about in the article as well, in in the first chapter of John, to those who received him, who believed on his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And I think that's that intimate new covenant relationship that we have as the church that the rest of the world doesn't have. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for clearing that up. Just one more, more one more thing in, in dealing with some of the topical issues that you've talked about recently. Um, I, I think you did an interview recently where you talked about the essentials of the Christian faith. And it would take hours and days and, and weeks to really dig into this. But, you know, there's the famous saying, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, freedom, but in all things, love. Uh, what are some of the, why, why is, why is Christian should we, uh, focus down and, and, and drill down on the essentials of the ish, of the Christian faith and have freedom and other things. And, and my, that's a convoluted question, but let me ask it another way. What are the essentials of the Christian faith, Krista? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that And if people want to check out that interview, it's on my friend Elisa Childers' podcast. If you go to her YouTube channel, elisachilders.com, um, you can check out that interview. And, uh, I, you know, I'll go into more detail there than I will uh, on uh, in this venue. But I think that when people say that little that little saying of, you know, in all things or in the essentials unity, it assumes that we have all clearly identified and agreed upon what the essentials are or what the non-essentials are. And I don't think that that, that is um, discussed often enough. So what I like to look at as a foundation of the essentials is the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed comes in the mid to late 300s, and it's just simply putting in writing the the body of beliefs that were held in common by Christians. And the Nicene Creed is particularly helpful because it's a creed that's agreed upon by all three branches of the Christian church. Protestants, Roman Catholics, and the Eastern Orthodox. And in that, you know, we're, we're talking about things like that God is the creator of all things, that there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that Jesus was born of a virgin, and he died under Pontius Pilate, and he was crucified and buried and resurrected, and he's coming again to judge the living and the dead, and that there's one holy Catholic apostolic church. And these are, these are sort of the, the core of our faith. I think 
the Nicene Creed is the foundational statement of faith that every Christian ought to understand. But I think it's it becomes um, truncated if that's our only statement of faith. I think that we also are looking at the modern context of issues that have come up. I would say the inerrancy of scripture. Um, I hold to the Chicago statement on inerrancy. In my opinion, the inerrancy of scripture right now is under the, the sharpest attack of all the doctrines, the great doctrines of our faith. And I think that there, in, we're going to see in coming years a, a, an attempt by formerly conservative entities to try to redefine inerrancy and renegotiate the Chicago Statement. In my opinion, I think the Chicago Statement on inerrancy ought to be considered as, as part of that core. You know, if I'm hiring somebody, if I'm in a Christian school context and I'm hiring an administrator, I want to have clarity about their view on inerrancy. I think that's a core issue. Um, I think thinking about things like the historical Adam and Eve, I think that's a, that's a pretty foundational issue because that even speaks to issues of race and racism that are happening right now in our culture. Um, I did a lot of work on that issue when I was at Reasons to Believe. I think a belief in historical Adam, a very important doctrine. Um, Belief in traditional marriage, um, not contained in the Nicene Creed, but very vital for today. And I would say that that is an essential part of our faith. So when I think about what are those essentials, those are kind of the four big ones for me that I look look for is the Nicene Creed, Chicago Statement on Inerrancy, Historical Adam and Eve, traditional marriage. To me, what we have to understand about uh, Christianity is that it's, so it's a worldview. Um, It starts with the sinner's prayer, but that's not the whole thing. Um, It, 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 it is much more than that. It's a very robust um, framework and and system of beliefs. And I've also heard you say it's important to know what we believe and why we believe it. So, it seems like, just from my a layman's perspective here, um, as a Christian, I should know what I believe, but more importantly, why I believe it. Can you can you break yeah. that down just a little bit for me, please? Yeah, because the why really matters in this day and age, where there's such a competition of religious ideas or non-religious ideas. Um, why do you believe Christianity? The answer to that. The short answer should be, 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 I believe in Christianity because it's true. If you don't have a heart conviction that it's true, then believing in it is kind of shaky. If it's, if it's only based on your experience, somebody from another religion could have an equally powerful experience. My, my brother is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I love my brother. We're very close. And um, we have many, many conversations about the fact that he's LDS and I'm what I call a historic Christian or a Nicene Christian. This is just how we talk between each other, how we, how we designate each other. Um, but both of us believe that our religion is true. But in our conversations, he largely believes that, that, that the LDS perspective is true. His foundation for that is his testimony. It is what he calls, you know, that, that experience, that part for him. For me, as a historic Christian, why do I believe Christianity is true? Is because I believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Because if Jesus came back to life, never to die again, that changes everything. So it's not, yes, I do have a Christian testimony of my conversion, but my belief isn't based on that at its foundation. And so I believe Christianity because I believe it's true, because I believe the resurrection really happened. So knowing what we believe about traditional marriage, for for example, people can have all kind of beliefs today about marriage, all kind of beliefs. How do you arbitrate those? How do you decide what a true belief is versus a false belief? Well, in my opinion, the only way to get there 
is that you're answering the question, Christianity is true. And that histor- the historic view of, tr- of marriage is what is true because God invented marriage in Genesis 1 and 2. And so, therefore, he, he invented it. He sets up the rules. He sets up the definitions. Knowing why we believe something must proceed what we believe. Otherwise, it's just a pool of a bunch of people's beliefs just kind of all floating yeah. around in the atmosphere out there. Very sound advice. Know why we believe it and yeah. also what we believe. And, and thank you for that. Now, you, you you wear a lot of different hats, Krista. You're a theology ma- mom. Excuse me. You're a podcaster, all the things podcast. You're a scholar. You're you're an apologist and you're, you're many other things, but apart from all of these hats that you wear, what else do you do besides <laughs> these? So, you know, what do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? That's a very interesting question. <laughs> um, you know, I used to have hobbies. <laughs> when I was a young woman uh, for many, many years. I actually had a hobby of doing mixed martial arts. Um, oh, wow. And uh, I did that for about 12 years, and that was a fun season in my life, and I really enjoyed that. Um, I don't do that anymore. I got a little too old, and my hands are a little too arthritic to be throwing throwing leather all the time. But, um, yeah, I don't – I don't. I can't say that I have a ton of hobbies anymore. I, I am just so committed. I guess for me, here's what shifted, is that um, I really believe we're living in urgent times. And so, to be honest, I've just kind of, I, I'm in a season now of being an empty nester, and I've just dedicated my life that um, I'm going to work as hard as I can for the kingdom. I wake up every day with a sense of urgency, and what am I going to do today? And that's probably why I'm quasi-obsessed with pushing out so much content, because of the letters that we receive uh, from people are said, you know, I've grown up in the church my whole life and I've never had anybody explain it, um, my, the faith this way. And this is so helpful. And now I'm discipling my kids and now I'm, I'm taking ownership and responsibility for, um, my children and their education. And, and that, that's, I, I just have really dedicated my life and what's left of it, um, as long as I can work to doing that. And so I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not a very interesting person, I guess. Uh, um, I, I just hang out with my family and um, I watch, I, I'm just always researching and I, I love learning. Uh, it's probably the biggest hobby I have is learning. I just, I just love to learn new things and, and, uh, you know, just being at home with my kids or uh, my husband and just being with my family. Uh, I love being with my family really more than anything. And uh, we do a lot of traveling and speaking. I love meeting new people when we're out on the road. Um, I I have a wonderful life. And I'm just going to keep pressing forward with a full court press until either the Lord comes back or the government comes knocking on my door (laughs) to take me away. (laughs) Which may may be very soon. Yes. Unfortunately. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, you you do an amazing job at at the gifts that God has given you. And it's obvious. And... uh, you know, all of the things that you're involved with, I'll put links at the bottom of the video that it, folks investigate what she does. Uh, she, she's God's gifted her. She, she's doing amazing things for the kingdom. And the, the thing that really strikes me with, with your podcast and your, your videos and your articles and, and so forth is you really encourage those. You, you, can, you can bring theology down to a level that the layman can understand. And I think when you do that, you get many more people involved than you would have previously because you don't need a Ph.D. necessarily to be an apologist or be a defender of the Christian faith. We can all do that. We just need to have the knowledge. We need to have the understanding. And you certainly have the ability to bring it down to the layman's level. That's what I appreciate about you. Oh, that's very kind. And you're absolutely right. I think that my favorite thing to do is I teach um, online theology classes through my website Man, I love doing that. I mean, it, it's it's open to anybody, but it's predominantly women who sign up. And um, just all different walks of life. 
and we get it together on Zoom once a week and um, talk about theology. Or I did a class on how to how to interpret the Bible properly. Um, and I think that's probably the thing I enjoy the most is doing those classes, being able to watch those women grow in their faith. Some of them have taken two, three, four classes from me now. And I just see how they're, they've come so far that now some of them are women's ministers at their church or working with their youth group or discipling their kids. And uh, I had one, one of my theology students over the weekend send me a worship song that she wrote last Friday as a result of being in my theology class. She wrote a worship song about the atonement because that was something we had studied in the class. That's just the most gratifying thing to me that regular people begin to lay hold of their faith in deeper ways and then think creatively to pass that on to others. That is just an amazing blessing. I get humbled every day that I get to partner with the Lord in doing his work. It's really all about him. Um, and every blessing I have is a result of, of what he's allowed me to have. And I just give all glory and honor to, to God for, for what he's, he allows me to do every day. Amen to that. And as we bring the plane in for a landing, Krista, what's on your agenda? For the future? Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, in my hopes and dreams, um, maybe I can get over my fear of uh, writing a book. Some, I, I've written a couple smaller books when I was at Reasons to Believe. But, you know, maybe writing a book, maybe that'll get my, me over my fear where I might be able to write two or three eventually. Um, I hope that the, the, the thing that I'm really enjoying right now is working with Christian schools to do trainings as alternative trainings to the diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings that so many businesses and schools are putting their employees through. Um, and I've been developing an alternative to that from a Christian point of view. And um, I really enjoy getting on Zoom, speaking with administrators, board members, talking about their vision for preserving their legacy at their Christian school, how they can hire smarter, um, how they can train their teachers um, in a biblical vision for racial unity uh, and justice and really working with leaders. I think my hope would be that, uh, the Lord would continue to give me favor in that area and that more schools would continue to reach out to us, uh, for mentoring and help. Um, but we'll see what the Lord has. I never know what's around the corner, uh, in his mind. And I'm just here to, to serve and keep running the race as long as he allows. Very, very sound wisdom there. Now, Krista, if someone wants to look into your resources, yeah. what's the best way to do that? Yeah, you How just, can they find you? Yeah, just go to centerforbiblicalunity.com. So that's centerforbiblicalunity.com. And that's all of the work that Monique and I do on race, race unity, and justice. You can also go to my YouTube channel, uh, Theology Mom. I'm everywhere as Theology Mom. Follow me on Facebook. YouTube. Uh, I have a website and uh, I have classes. We run book groups through the Center for Biblical Unity. So those are really the two destinations where you can get connected with me. Absolutely. And I'll have those links below the video. Um, Krista, I'm going to ask you to hang on for just a couple of minutes after the conclusion. But Krista Bontrager, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to be here. And until next time.